started. So hopefully we can get the powers on just a little bit. So, well, welcome. Thank you for uh, tuning in to this uh, Bible study. Uh, we're talking about anxiety. Uh, we're looking at texts within the Bible where people become anxious and we're trying to figure out what the Bible um, can teach us about um, dealing with that kind of anxiety in our daily lives. So, so why don't we begin uh, with prayer? Let's pray. Speak to us, Lord, as we meditate on your word this night. Come to our aid when we encounter anxiety in our daily lives. We entrust this time into your hands. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, so here, let me, uh, let me pull up the, whoops. Here is our, um, here's our reading for tonight. Um, I'm going to read it, and then um, I'll give you um, a little bit of time um, to meditate on it um, silently, and then we can uh, talk about it. So it's from Matthew 14. This should be a, um, a familiar text to us, but we may um, find new uh, treasures in this text when we think about it from the uh, point of view of anxiety. So it says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. When the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area, and soon people were bringing all their sick to be healed. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. So I'm going to give you a moment just to meditate uh, silently on this passage. Okay, so um, we're going to look at um, the very first two verses first. Um, I'll reread them. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. So the... Um, the first question is, is why do you think um, Jesus sent the disciples ahead of him to cross to the other side of the lake? Um, now, it's very helpful, um, you know, when it says after all of these things, it's very um, important to know what's going on in this story. Um, at the beginning of chapter 14, we have the story of Jesus, I'm sorry, of John the Baptist being beheaded. Um, and then Following when Jesus finds that out, the next thing he does is he feeds the, uh, the 5,000. Um, so those come back to back. Um, 
So the fact that he tells the disciples to get into the boat and uh, he goes off to himself or by himself to pray, um, thinking of this in terms of anxiety, I would argue that Jesus, uh, that's a lot to handle. You know, you find out that your cousin, um, the forefronter of his ministry, um, you know, has been beheaded because of what he is doing. And then, you know, you have to figure out how to feed the, the 5,000 people and all of that. Um, that's just a lot of anxiety causing kind of things. And so I think um, the first lesson we can um, talk about tonight is the need that when we get uh, very anxious times to find a time just to uh, be by ourselves, um, to kind of decompress and maybe talk to God or whatever you do in that moment, um, instead of just continue to go, 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 and just uh, continue to add uh, the anxiety um, into your life. So right now. So any comments on that? Remember, if you want to talk, raise your hand. Okay. Yes, Peg. I do think that was his plan. He needed, he needed to decompress. He had uh, a heavy burden. He had been physically, emotionally, spiritually drained, and he needed to be refreshed by his father. And he needed to do that alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Carol. Well, the literal person that I am, he also had to distance himself so he could walk on the water towards them. You know, yeah. so he had to put some space between them. <laughs> And then that's a spoiler alert for the record. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah. Yes, Jim. I think there's another uh, aspect too. I think that Jesus is really, aside from what everyone has already said, that he's really kind of testing his disciples to see whether or not they had learned anything from the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And he knew that they did not, they had not learned. But in order to make any sense of that, you have to look at other scriptures. And I particularly looked at John 6, 14, uh, where they said, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. I think that's an important thing. Yes, yes. Um, you know, and, and sometimes uh, when we get, um, have a lot of um, things that cause anxiety in our lives, we just think, you know, I'll deal with that later, I'll deal with that later. Um, and then it can cause all kinds of issues. We talked about all of the health issues that um, anxiety can cause in our lives. So sometimes we just have to be cognizant enough to say, you know what, of all this stuff that's going on in my life right now, maybe I just need to, to slow down or to take an evening off and just kind of regroup and recenter um, or whatever you do. We're going to talk at the end of this Bible study about, you know, things that we can actually do that are helpful um, to overcome anxiety. So um, yes, Carol. I was just going to say during some of our anxiety times in our lives, I, I tend to shut down, just shut down. And that's when I learned to pray without words, which was really comforting for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Lorraine, did you have your hand up? Uh, I thought that he, they sent them the head so that he could show them that they could trust them and that they would no, have no fear if they believed in him. Okay, yes. Um, very good. So let's, uh, let's keep going. Um, so verse 24 says, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. Um, so what happens um, to the disciples during their time apart from Jesus? Right away, this terrible storm arises. Um, and interesting here, notice... Um, Jesus says that they get it back into the boat and they start going, you know, to the lake. And then notice at the very end, it says night fell while they were there alone. So they get in the boat when it's still light. And then all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden they, um, they're in this, um, 
Um, so they get in the boat when it's still it's still light, and then they get out into the middle of the lake. Um, so it turns dark, and then they get into this issue, right? That the storms are starting to build. Um, and remember, there. Um, I'm going to show you a picture in a minute of one of these Galilean fishing boats. And um, these are not meant to to deal with storms. Um, these, in fact, here, let me just bring that up. Um, so here, if you've never seen a picture, here's a picture. Um, these are tiny little vessels. I, I looked it up. They're about um, 25 feet long, which is about the size of a UPS uh, truck, just to give you a, you know, if you're a visual person. Uh, and it's seven feet wide. Um, so there's, there's not much to it. It's meant, uh, it's meant to always be close to the shore when they're fishing for the simple reason is they're not meant to, to deal with the storms. Um, here's another picture of one uh, when you get a lot of guys in there. Um, it gets uh, very crowded. So these, uh, you know, these aren't vessels that are meant to hold up to any kind of storm whatsoever. They were just very simple um, vessels that were meant to, to be used as a, a fishing vessel. So um, does that make sense? Yes. yes. So they get out and notice it says uh, they get in trouble far away from land. Um, the commentaries that I looked at, they're about three miles out. <laughs> so they're, wow. in, they're in a lot of trouble. Um, um, and so then notice uh, verse 25 says about three o'clock in the morning. So let's stop there. So how many um, hours have they been in this boat by then? Probably seven or eight. Yes, a long time, yeah. right? So they have been fighting this storm for a, for a very, very long time. Um, that would be a, um, that would be a why in the world did Jesus um, wait so long question for me. But um, so about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Um, so in this story, um, Jesus, you know, goes off by himself. They get out into the storm, causing all of this problem. Uh, and then Jesus shows up and everything is fine, right? No, no. Not is fine. So what, what happens when Jesus shows up? Peter wants to go walk with him. Well, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, so, so they when, thought he was a ghost. A ghost. Yeah. yeah, so it's, you know, when they see this figure walking on the water, it's not a matter of, thank you, you know, now we're, we're finally going to be okay, but uh, things literally go from bad to worse. Um, so they're uh, more scared of the ghost than they are of the water, do you think? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Yeah, it would have been a, yeah. an evil ghost in the Bible were always evil spirits. Um, so yeah, this would have been um, something very terrifying. And in fact, they may have thought that this evil spirit was causing the, the storm. So um, yeah. So um, another thing that jumped out at me in this text, the fact that it's 3 a.m., what happens uh, when we're facing a lot of anxiety when we get, don't get enough sleep? What happens? You hallucinate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just, it makes it worse, right? Um, and in fact, a lot yeah. of times, uh, anxiety, um, it. Yeah. yes, it, um, it causes us to not be able to sleep, uh, which just causes more and more anxiety. So um, I, th I think they lost more than control of their boat. They lost control of their emotions. And I think Laureen mentioned it before. They lost trust in Jesus. Because when Jesus said in the beginning there, you know, I want you to go ahead and go on the other side, that's what he meant. Go on the other side. They're <clears> going <throat> to get there no matter what. They just didn't believe him. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the text. Um. So, you know, when the disciples saw um, him walking on the water, they were terrified. Uh, but Jesus spoke to them at once, do not be afraid, take courage, I am here. So what do you think those words meant to um, those disciples in that boat? You know, when they finally realized that the, um, that the, um, 
that ghost that they are seeing is literally Jesus himself. What do you think that did uh, for the disciples? Yes, Marcia. Well, I think just the sound of his voice, just knowing his voice um, gave them strength and reassured them that he was there. Yeah. And you know, what a difference it makes when we're going through anxious times to know that Jesus is really with us. Um, you know, do... And to be encouraged to not be afraid. Yeah. To not be afraid. Yes. Um, yes, Carol. Well, they'd just seen him do some miracles, so they probably knew that he would take care of them again, or would hope that he would. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and there's, there's something very interesting uh, theologically going on here. Um, in verse 27, when Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, he said, take courage, I am here, he says. Um, and these three words in Greek is just two words, and the two words in Greek is ego ami, um, which literally means I am. Um, now, when we see that in Greek, it literally takes us back to the um, story of Moses and the burning bush, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when, um, when Moses, when God is calling Moses, you know, he's very, very frustrated that you can imagine Moses' anxiety level just rising um, terribly high. And he says, you know, who should I say is sending me if they ask? You know, they're, they're, in other words, they're going to laugh at me to say, you know, all of this stuff is going to happen to you. Um, and God says, tell them what? <laughs> I am. Mm -hmm. um, and Moses said, well, I am what? You know, what does that mean? Well, knowing that that is God's name, uh, when we hit this story um, in Matthew's gospel, it's very interesting that um, this isn't just um, Jesus that's coming along now all of a sudden. Jesus is telling them that, you know, ego and me, that I am. In other words, the Father and I are one, as um, John would say. Um, mm -hmm. and the, reason, the reason I mention that, this is going to become very uh, important when we get um, to uh, when Peter walks on the water. So this is not just um, Jesus, their friend, walking with them, that this is God himself. And this is what Matthew wanted his community to understand, that this is not just um, this simple peasant, um, you know, Galilean walking with them, that this is none other than than God himself. Mm. <coughs> Any comments on that? Just me. Yeah, I just, I just think, you know, when th they saw him as a ghost because of their human emotion, and, and when he says, I am, uh, they didn't see him at that moment as the Son of God, as the Messiah. But when he said that, I am, yeah. that brought it all into perspective for him. Yeah. And that that was the calming force for them. Yeah, in some, you know, it doesn't matter whether the disciples uh, picked up on that. Um, Matthew's point is the community that he's writing to, he wants to make sure that they pick up on it. He wants to make sure that we know uh, that Jesus isn't just this, you know, ordinary person, that this is, um, you know, God in the flesh. Um, any other comments? So then we go um, to Peter. Um, so I'm going to read uh, 28 and 29. So then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. So why do you think Peter is asking um, Jesus to come out onto the water? What's going on here? What's He's impetuous. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Um, yes, Marcia. And, and it almost seems like Peter is testing Jesus to make sure that it's really him. He's the one that's um, setting up the rules of the test. Okay. If it is really you, let me walk on the water to you. Yeah, so it's almost like Peter needs a sign from Jesus to say, you know, if it really is you, prove right. I mean, that you're going to make a difference when, you know, the storms of life rage. That's kind of what... Reassur reassurance beyond a doubt. Yes. Um, you know, he's, I'm sure he's asking a question like, you know, can I really trust God when I face impossible circumstances? And that's a question I think we all have asked. Um, but he wants proof. Um, you know, it's, it's the same thing as, you know, the doubting Thomas. I hate we <laughs> doubting, but... 
uh, the fact that Thomas, um, you know, he needs proof. You know, all the other disciples saw the risen Jesus. They were able to, to see his nail scarred hands, but Thomas wasn't there. And so he says, unless I see it for myself, I won't believe. Um, you know, he wants proof that, yes, this is, in fact, um, this Jesus that he mm -hmm. has come to know. So, um, so then let's keep going. So 30 and 31. Um, but when Peter saw the strong winds and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. You know, he was walking on the water just fine, but um, when he looked at the winds and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And he said, save me, Lord. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? So what's going on here? How can we relate to this? Yes, Chet. Did he really doubt Jesus or did he doubt himself? Yeah, good question. Uh, doubt, did he doubt his own faith? Yes. The, um, you know, when um, the fact, um, the story says when uh, Peter kept his eyes focused on Jesus, he was fine. But when he focused on the problems, um, you know, the winds and the waves around him, then he began to sink. Um, you know, that's, um, yeah, someone once told me the, uh, what is it uh, that uh, don't tell um, God how big your storms are, but tell your storm how big your God is. Um, <laughs> So, you know, where's the focus when we go um, through difficult times in our lives? Where is our focus? Is it on the, the, the circumstance? Is it on the problem? Or is it on the problem solver? Um, you know, trusting that somehow, some way, um, you know, God's going to let me walk on water. If the, the problem is a storm, then um, somehow, some way, God is going to get me through it. So other thoughts? Yes, Carol. Well, I, it made me think about so many times when you pl make pleas in your prayers, just, you know, please answer my prayers and whatever, and then you don't get an answer. And then all of a sudden you decide that you're gonna let go. And then all of a sudden the answer is there. So it's more on my part at least is just continually learning to trust and let go. And I'm not in charge, not let, let God be in charge and not me. Yeah. So that's my continue. But I mean, I don't want to say it's like I'm testing him, but when I finally figure out to let go, then my answer is clear. Yeah. So to uh, um, speak of that in the language of the text, it would be when Peter, you know, relied on God's power. Uh, right. You know, he was fine, but when he relied on his own power, trying to, you know, solve it himself, then, you know, we see. <laughs> you know, and the, the funny part of this text is, you know, Peter, his name in Greek is what? You know, the rock. Um, and rocks are going to sink, you know, there's a, there's always humor in these texts. Um, but it, even if you twist that around, then the fact that God even can make a rock, you know, even uh, walk on water, that's, that's quite, um, quite amazing. So any other thoughts? <laughs> so let's see what happens next. Um, verse 32 so, um, you know, um, Jesus grabbed Peter's hands, you know, pulled him up out of the water, and then they climbed back into the boat, and the wind stopped. Now, what truth can we learn about this? What does this teach us about Jesus? Well, I think it goes back to what Carol said. When you let go, then you have peace, and God will... It may not be the answer you were looking for, but God will answer you in some way. Yes. Um, yes, Lorene. I think, and I do this too, and they were doing it, is try to do things yourself. And it's wrong. You should turn it over to God and have faith. And I think they were trying to calm themselves in the boat and not trust Jesus. Yes. When we have this text um, in other gospels, um, we hear um, Jesus, um, you know, put up his hand and say, peace be still, and the wind ceased. Um, to, that's, you know, a, 
to help us understand that even Jesus has the power over creation because he is the creator and not, you know, part of God's creation. In other words, Jesus is not created, uh, but is, uh, you know, one with God. Uh, in the beginning, you know, um, the word was with God. That's, uh, um, we always think the fact that Jesus came to earth, you know, as a human being that, that Jesus is created, but he is part of the Trinity. He's part of the, the Godhead, we might say, um, God in the flesh. So, um, so I think the fact that the moment that Jesus gets in that boat, the wind ceases, that lets us know that no matter what storm we're going to face, that Jesus is always uh, stronger, always more powerful, um, that there's not a, a storm that we're ever going to face in our lives where Jesus is going to say, oh, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to handle this. He's, he's already got it under control, and we just have to, to trust that. Um, so did I see a hand? Okay, so let's keep going. Um, remember um, when Jesus says, I am here, you know, the ego of me. So let's keep going. So here we go. He climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and then the disciples worshiped him. And they said, you really are the son of God. Um, so <laughs> right away, you know, there's that um, tagline that we're looking for. So in verse 27, Jesus tells them that I am, but here, um, within Matthew's gospel, they finally say, you really are the son of God. In other words, they claim that. Um, they realize that, yes, Jesus really is who he says he is. And it's interesting in Matthew's gospel that this is the only time that the disciples um, call Jesus the son of God. And it's when Jesus mm -hmm. refers to himself as, as I am. Um, uh, yes, Carol. Well, when they say that, is that because they couldn't see him because it was dark? Or are they doubting who he is, who he is. Well, yeah, I think you can read it on both levels. Um, mm -hmm. Theologically, Matthew wants to make sure that um, we realize that, um, you know, Jesus calls himself the I am, he is God. Um, and then the disciples finally, um, you know, decide, yes, you know, that's who he is. So, um, hello, hello. <laughs> yeah, we just finally figured it out. <laughs> yeah, we, we started 6.30, by the way. <laughs> We're slow. We just finally figured it out. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I'm glad you're here. So, so this is a um, trivia question for you. Um, in Mark's gospel, um, when and where does this declaration that, um, well, the exact um, quote is, surely this was the son of God um, in Matthew's gospel. There's, anytime you hear this, the son of God, normally Jesus is called the son of man. I'm not going to get into the difference between the son of man and the son of God tonight. That's a whole nother Bible study. But does anyone remember in the gospel of Mark where the person says, surely this man was the son of God? Yes. On the cross. Yeah, yeah. the soldier at the cross. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's the member, it's the centurion. It's the Roman centurion, the, centurion. the, the total right. outsider. Um, in Mark's gospel. So um, in Matthew's gospel, you have it's his own disciples, but in Mark's gospel, you have someone on the outside. By the way, in Mark's gospel, the disciples never get anything right ever. <laughs> you know, it's a, in Mark's gospel, after the uh, feeding of the 5,000, um, the next morning they get up and he starts teaching them and they say, well, Jesus, if you would just give us a sign, do some kind of miracle for us, then we can actually believe. You know, and he's just saying, uh, you know, I just, <laughs> just spent 5,000 people with a snack. Um, but they said, give us a sign, Jesus, you know, and um, we, we kind of shake our heads. But um, if you're ever feeling like you're not measuring up, you always need to read Mark's gospel because the disciples never, ever get it right in Mark's gospel. So ever. I always gives me peace. When I doubt, I remember I'm not the only one that doubted. That's right. That's right. So, um, so is it's, it? Oh, go ahead, Jim. It, it's interesting too to me that in Matthew, they you know he talks about Peter walking on the water to Jesus. In John's Gospel, it's not even mentioned. Jesus walks on the water, and they let him come in the boat, and then all of a sudden they're on the other side. Yes. So, kind of confusing. Yes. Any more comments on that? And just when we think we're in the clear, you know, 
Finally, the anxiety is at a lower level. Jesus is with us now. Um, look how this story ends in verse 34. After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. When the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area, and soon people were bringing all their sick to be healed. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. Um, so let's, let's think about that in terms of anxiety. What is going on there? Hello. <laughs> so, you know, here, let's let's just deal with the anxiety of the the text we have. Um, yeah, right here. We have the beheading of John the Baptist, we have the feeding of the 5000, um, you know, two high anxiety uh, moments and then we have um, this huge storm and then they think it's a ghost and they finally realize it's Jesus and they're they're safe and they step off um, and to the shore and what happens? You know, all this new anxiety is, is forced. Piles up. Yes. So what does that tell us about life? Doesn't go away. Yeah, it's, an, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an always there. Thing, right? Well, I have a question. Yes. So did they go back to the same side where he fed the 5,000? Because if he didn't, how did they get word out that all these people showed up? They didn't have phones or, <laughs> you know, I. Yes, I don't know. I am. I haven't been to the Holy Land, but I understand that this lake is really not, um, you know, in some spots, it's really not that wide. It's, um, it's not like Lake Texoma kind of lake. Uh, and so maybe, you know, maybe it's really not that um, small or it's a small area. So the word would have, you know, spread quickly. So, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. So. Um, but we'd all be lining up to touch him if we, you know, we all have something going on in our lives. We'd want to get healed. Yes, yes. Ken said from the Ken Ken said from the peanut gallery, it's always one thing right after another. Yes. So that's his contribution. <laughs> yes. So if it's an everyday kind of thing, then we have to figure out um, ways to alleviate that anxiety. Right? It's not a matter of oh, I hope there's not going to be any anxiety that comes up, you know, because there's always going to be um, roll your chair in here. Yes. Roll your chair in so today, here. Um, today, um, you know, at work, roll I mean, I, I never know what ministry is going to bring, but just, you know, one after another today. This morning, you know, I got a message about uh, Dave and so and soon after that, we got the, the note about uh, Kit. I'm um, just oh, over and over and over you know, things started happening. So we have to find um, ways in our lives uh, that when um, we have anxious days, you know, how, how do we deal with that? Um, and if we just keep putting it off, guess what? Then the next day is just going to bring more and more anxiety. So, um, so I, oh, yes. Is that Laura? I'm sorry. I can't. Yes. Okay. I just, I find it interesting that when they, when they get to, you know, the other side of the lake or whatever, mm -hmm. those people right. are so ready to, you know, embrace and, and want some sort of miracle and want to touch him and all that. And Jesus went through all those other things with people that should have already been or had faith and things like that. It, it's just interesting to me that the word spread and these people are so ready to embrace it they're so desperate they're willing to just be like okay you know please just whatever do what you can for us you know and jesus had to prove his way to his own disciples and on the way there yes I just find it interesting. Yes, yeah. I don't, I can't explain it. I just find that interesting. And why, you know, just why? Why are they so ready to believe in his own people that have already seen so many interesting, miraculous things 
are still like, okay, yeah, that was yesterday. What are you doing today? <laughs> yeah. You know, but these people are like, we haven't seen anything. You know, give it to me. Yeah. You know. Yes. So yes, they believe. Yeah, and they're yeah. ready to believe because their lives are so desperate and they're yeah. so anxious and they are stressed and they're just like, I'm ready to do whatever it takes. Yes. Believe whatever it is. And notice, it yeah, notice in verse 36 where it says they begged him to let the sick yeah. touch at least the fringe yes. of his robe. Looky there. Yeah. Um, you know, just. Um, you know, there's another story of a woman, you know, just touching the fringe because she believes just, yeah. to, just to, you know, barely touch the fringe of the robe is all you need because of the power um, of healing within Jesus. Um, so talk about a, a strong faith. Uh, right. Just I to mean, get close the, to Jesus is enough for them. Yeah. And those people had faith without really seeing everything that those others have seen, you know, being on the boat, being before the boat. I mean, they, they weren't even there. They had already heard about it and they were just like, oh, please, you know. I, I mean, I think everybody can relate to that. They may not have had so much happen in their own life. They may have heard it in other people's lives and they're just so like, you know, please God, please, you know, we're ready. We're so ready for you to just give us a miracle or deliver us from something, you know, relieve any kind of pain or stress or anxiety. Yes. Kind of sounds like us. That's where we are. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and um, the interesting thing, um, you know, people always say, well, why didn't Jesus heal everyone? You know, sometimes they go into these towns um, and he heals and there's all these other people, but Jesus goes on from there. Um, and I, you know, I always thought how, I mean, can you imagine you being the next in line and Jesus saying, I'm sorry, I have to move on. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I would have said some choice words, I think, but, um, but the, the, the whole point of miracles within these, it's, it's to instill faith. And so um, you don't have to be the one who gets healed, but just to recognize of the healing power that is within this, this person of Jesus Christ, um, you know, that in and of itself is to, to instill faith within us. Um, so it's not a matter of that you have to be healed uh, in the gospels, but it's just you know, the miracle of, of just being in the presence of someone, just one person being healed, all of a sudden it's to instill faith within us. Um, so, yes, Lois. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if this fits in or if I'm too late saying this, but if the, the gals have read the September issue of Gather Magazine, there's a most interesting article in there by Peter Sonoli, I think, uh, that this COVID-19 being in, in all the time like this and, and being apart from loved ones and friends, uh, it was called uh, some, some kind of dementia. It wasn't the regular dementia that her, her husband was having that problem. If they, they read this, very interesting um, how that affects people. I don't know, anyone read that yet? In the September issue. I guess no. not. Jim said no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he would. But it, it's really, it's really good. Um, um, and I never, I never thought of that. So it, it, and I'm, I'm that way. I can't keep up with the days and um, the weeks and the yeah and time in itself. So um, I was, we were talking about anxiety, and I guess it's still on anxiety. Uh, I just thought that was so interesting. It made me realize that I guess a lot of people are having that problem now so there's where uh, that's when I was having that bluesy thing uh, I had to turn to prayer and just rely on God to, to lift me up because uh, as my family knows I got real melancholy and <laughs> everything so um, I just talk about trust that's yeah. what I had to do is just put my trust in, in the Lord yes Yes. Yes, Carol. Well, I was, I was also thinking that, you know, if word had gotten out that this man can heal people, even if I was a skeptic, I might go check it out. And then whether I was or wasn't, that would be one more way to, I don't want to use the word recruit, but 
form new Christians, just like we reach out in different ways through our church for people who may or may not be Christians yet, but they just want to check it out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, to me, that was another way to make new disciples, just through word getting out and people touching them or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Good point. So uh, do you think that Yes. <laughs> you think that today, uh, Carol said, you know, uh, getting out and touching people, uh, I guess we, we have to be careful of that because so many times we have these, uh, I don't know, meetings or whatever you call them, of some of the uh, churches that, you know, they'll all go up there and the man, <laughs> somebody, and I think we have to be real careful about that because... Really? Yeah, uh, because mm -hmm. I I didn't I mean modern, thing, huh? I didn't mean modern day touching. I meant for the people who met Jesus. Oh, okay. Door okay. touching. So we're talking about also going out and touching. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know. Do that uh, again, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> um, on Sunday, uh, you may have seen the picture on Facebook, but on Sunday they put together 260 uh, bags of food and. Mm -hmm. Oh, I saw that. Them. Yes, the Meals on Wheels uh, delivery people uh, delivered them this week, and we always get all of these calls. And it's not just a simple thank you, um, but they say things like, you know, I live by myself, I have no family here, and this bag makes me feel loved. Um, and so these kinds of stories always remind me that, you know, we're not talking about a, a jar of peanut butter and, and that kind of stuff anymore. We're talking about, you know, the, the kingdom of God going out into the world and, um, you know, so when they get a bag, they're, they're looking at all the food, but they're also realizing, you know, there's, there's someone who cares about me. Um, I can imagine some of these people feel very um, just, you know, forgotten. And, you know, does anyone like, I mean, I've heard people say, you know, if I would die today, would anyone even know it? Or would anyone even care? Um, you know, it's amazing what just a bag, a simple bag of food can do. So um, mm -hmm. talk about reaching out and, and touching. Yes, Lorene. Well, I, that is touching lives. Yes. I mean, it doesn't have, I mean, it's still modern. You don't have to touch like with the coronavirus, but you can touch other ways. Yes, indeed. So, yes. Yes, Laura. Mom and I were part of Sunday packing those bags. And I know we even mentioned it when we were doing it, I think that we hard. were hoping that yeah. it would you know, no, touch people in a way that they would know we're thinking of them. And we thought about the different items as we were putting them in the bag. Like, I, you know, I wonder if they will really like this. And then we thought about certain dietary things. We were really excited, Mom and I, because there was even Hershey bars, you know, being put in some of the bags. And we thought, oh, well, some people that get the bag may not want to eat the Hershey bar, or have a dietary thing, but they may have um, a grandchild or someone come oh, visit yeah. and, oh, look, we got, I have a Hershey bar to share with you. Yes. You know, we just thought that it was, it, we just really hoped that it would bring something to these people as we were packing the bags. I mean, we did talk about it, all of us that were in the room and you know, we were excited about it, and you know, we were even seeing how some of the snacks made us hungry. And like, oh, thank goodness, we ate lunch before we packed these bags. You know, brought something for us to eat. So we were hoping they felt the same way. You know, yes. happy to have it and reaching out to them. And it was, you know, I, I felt very blessed to be a part of it and to help. And I love packing bags. I just love it. <laughs> is like so my thing yes so you know yeah yeah and mom and i even put stickers on the bags we were the ones who put the stickers so we were hoping everybody likes the stickers we made sure everybody got a smiley face and a heart and butterflies and things that we thought would cheer them up and you know we felt like everybody needs a smile yes so we made sure every bag had a smiley face we're like everybody has to have a smile on their day yeah. So, you know. Amen. Maybe, awesome. Maybe yes. I have too many smiles on my own, but, you know, yeah. it's just, you Well, know, yeah, thank you all for being a part of that ministry. So, 
I know uh, this is a great passion of our church and a lot of people, they would have liked to be a part of that, but they just don't feel comfortable being around other people. So, um, you know, my hope is that we will continue to do that. So when all of this coronavirus gets behind us, um, you know, we can have large groups again to, to be a part of that. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so I want to close um, just with, you know, we talked about how anxiety is an everyday kind of thing. Uh, so we must find ways daily to alleviate anxiety when we start feeling it. So I just want us to talk about ways that we have found um, that help alleviate stress for us. Um, and maybe we can give each other uh, different ideas. So, so what do you do? How do you alleviate the stress that you feel in your daily life? Dogs? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's something else. <laughs> yes, yes. Trying to keep her quiet. No, nope. animals distress me. Okay. They, they are the perfect way. <laughs> yes, yes, Laura. Well, I have pets too, and that is totally a great way. But also, um, if you haven't noticed, I talk. I swear. <laughs> there is no holds barred. I will oh. tell anyone and everyone what's going on. Um, I share with my mom. Oh, yeah. Even if she doesn't want to hear it, <laughs> no. Um, I that's my way of releasing it and dealing with it. And once I let it out, surprisingly enough to y'all, I then become quiet, and then I can have my talk with God. And then it's just me and Him. I let out all the excess. You know, what's the word? Vomit. Emotions <laughs> and things going on, whatever. And the, I can then focus with God. Mm -hmm. But I have to let it out first. Yes. And then I can come to a point where I can be silent. Mm -hmm. She go outside. Yes. So. Yeah. I know for me, uh, music plays a, a huge role in de-stressing me. Uh, you know, there's certain things that I can listen to. Um, and I mean, I just, I just feel the stress. I mean, I feel my shoulders, you know, they're starting to loosen and just, I just feel like me again. And so, um, anyone, um, especially who comes in for counseling, uh, who is going through a difficult time, I always ask them that, you know, what is your m mode of de-stress? And a lot of times they don't even know what I'm talking about. I was like, you have to find something that you can always go to, um, that, you know, will de-stress you because you're always, you know, we're always going to deal with anxiety and stress and we have to find out a way, you know, exercise, walking, you know, there's a wonderful time of year to do that. I know exercise uh, for some of that. Sometimes it's just calling a specific person or talking to a specific person. Sometimes it's a spouse. Sometimes it's a good friend. Um, you know, just something that, you know, uh, if you do, um, it's going to help you de-stress. So any other ideas? I did that today. I have, I have a special friend that I call, Today, I was especially stressed out. Hello, Black Pearl, I see you. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I called this person and we talked for well over an hour. And when I got off the phone, I was totally relaxed. Mm -hmm. What a gift. Well, I truly agree with that, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, Carol. Well, if I can find something funny and laugh, that helps me. Yes. Um, and if Will will come home, then we laugh and we have fun and we all sleep well. There's just something about having your family together, even if it's just one hour or one day, whatever. Yes. That's mm -hmm. great healing for me. I, I, uh, yes, Lois. <laughs> I, I, I was sick for all of last week and I'm just getting out of it now. It's a sinus infection and uh, my doctor knows that. So uh, anyhow... <laughs> You're talking about getting outside and walking. Well, I that was I think that was my problem. I love to be outside, and I couldn't even sit out and drink a cup of coffee because the humidity and the ragweed and dust and dander just oh well they they weren't anything compared to that other stuff. So I, I really think you're right. Some whoever said that about walking and being outside uh, so that that helps me and and the music and. It's so odd because um, I've, I've been dragging up these hymns that I haven't heard in years, maybe that I learned as a kid, 
and singing them over and over. And finally, I was like, there's many more. You don't have to sing those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They can see Ron smiling Odd. back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other ideas that help you? Eating. Yes, Marcia. I like to read. Okay. And if I can, if <clears throat> particularly um, in times of anxiety, if I can read something of nonfiction that just kind of is like Calgon, take me away, and mm -hmm. you know, it just kind of eases my mind. Yes. Just helps to escape, huh? Yeah. Escape. Mm -hmm. Did you say something, Peg? I said eating, but I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> It does help, yes. yes. Oh my. When you do, your jaws relax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very cool. So okay. thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, next um, week, we're going to um, deal with um, Philippians, Philippians 4, 4 through 9, which is one of my all time favorite passages in the Bible. Uh, and we're going to talk about the power of prayer. Uh, that when we're feeling anxious, what role does prayer pa play and, um, you know, how we might pray in anxious times. Uh, sometimes we um, have a hard time coming up with the right words, especially when we're anxious. And what do we do during those times? Those are the kinds of things uh, that we're going to talk about. So um, I want to apologize for, be for us being late, but we really did have trouble with the, all that stuff. And I, then I finally picked up her did the old newsletter and we found out what we're supposed to do. Oh, okay. I thought you just could click on it and there everybody was. <laughs> Not that easy. Not Maybe Kathy could resend the link on Wednesday because I had to go back to Monday to find it. Oh, I yes. Did. Yeah, that's what I did. I did too. Okay. We have to do. Yeah. We have to remember that. We have to remember that each week it's going to be a different number. And I think, you know, in, instead of just thinking we can do what we did last week, we're signing into a new group each time. Each yes. Week. Each time we sign up, we have to be different. Yes. Great reminder. So, yes. Well, <laughs> let's, let's close with prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for uh, this time you have given us to um, just talk about matters of faith. And what a blessing it has been to... Um, just be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray that you would uh, just continue to show up in our lives, just as you showed up uh, during that storm that the disciples experienced. Uh, show up in the storms of our lives um, and tell us that who you are, that you are I am, that you are the Son of God, and that you are more powerful than any problem that we will ever face in daily life. And so we simply entrust this night into your hands. I pray that you would just give us restful sleep so that we can just wake tomorrow refreshed, um, able to serve you yet another day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being a part of this. All of you add so much. Um, yes, Marcia. I just wanted to say thank you, Pastor. Well, you're quite welcome. So... Um, this is really something to look forward to on Wednesday night. Yes, yes. it is. Yes. And uh, I wish uh, more and more people could join us because I think they would uh, find this a blessing as well. But um, I did notice there were quite a few people who watched the uh, recording of it. So um, I'm glad uh, we're able to record it so they can watch it uh, when their schedule allows. So, yep. So, so hopefully next week the uh, Richardsons will be here on time. Uh, that, we'll see. <laughs> We like to make a grand and appearance. Don't, don't pick on my poor little computer. <laughs> Lorene, Lorene. It's, a, it's a good guy. Yeah. But, but we did get mixed up. Yeah. Lorene, were you able to what pick all of us at, at one point or just the speakers? I could hear just the speakers. Okay. Just the, but yeah. you know, I don't put a number in. I use that whatever it is, that something chat. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And I was wondering if, um, I was wondering if the Richardsons had to stop and get coffee before they came here. <laughs> I made a cup of my own. <laughs> I did make a cup here. <laughs> well, it was good. At least, hey, thanks for asking. 
Yes. Um, but when we but when we join together again, you know, I will have my coffee with me. <laughs> yes. I know. I know. Yes. Maybe the letter. Corinne, that can be a that can be our uh, project for the rest of this week is to, to help you figure out how to get it on a, on a gallery view. So. Yeah. Lorraine, do you have an iPad? You have what? Do you have an iPad? No, I'm using a desktop. Okay. Oh. I can put you on an iPad. This this is a laptop. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Pastor. Sure. God Thank bless. You. Thank you. God bless y'all. So. I'm a little anxious about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I've got help. Black Pearl says good night. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>